can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Wise here, host of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs, leaders. Today's guest is founder of New Ground Ventures. I'll introduce him in a second, but without knowing, I have featured several of their companies, actually Pipedrive, uh, co-founder, you know, Zach, I don't know if you know this, co-founder Ermas came on, he talked about brain surgery, getting married and moving to Estonia to the US all in the same year. And at the time they had 10,000 paying customers when I interviewed them in 2013, now they over, have over 100,000 customers. It's amazing. Uh, one Hope Wine, which I am one of those customers. One Hope Wine, at the time when I interviewed Jake, the founder, they, have go, they went from zero to selling over 750,000 bottles a year. One Hope at the time had donated more than $2 million to date, helping provide over 1.1 million meals to people in need and plant 56,000 trees. It's probably a lot more now, so check them out. Um, and before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. I co-founded my business partner, John Corcoran, and we help business to business. You know, We help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help them run their podcast. Um, and for me, Zach, the number one thing in my life is relationships, and I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships and a podcast has allowed me to profile others thought leadership and bring them on to talk about what they're up to. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. And, uh, you know, a big thank you to Jason Rotman who re referred today's guest and he helps business owners and families use life insurance to protect and grow assets. Um, the same methods ultra rich use. So uh, fun fact is he played football at Princeton and we sat next to each other in geometry in high school. So Zach Zeitlin is founder of New Ground Ventures and New Ground is a venture capital investment platform established to fund and support breakthrough companies. And they invest from the early seed stage uh, to businesses with as much as $10 million in sales. And they have a particular focus on food, health and wellness, education, and technology. Some companies I have used or consumed uh, that they've invested in include Kavita, which is a delicious uh, drink, which I, I think have exited since then, a probiotics, um, kombucha, Copra, which I've tried, delicious coconut water um, and other frozen treats, Zevia, all, all healthy stuff, Zach, because I love what you guys do. And um, Zevia is, you know, you have to check it out. It's, it's natural and there's no sweetener, artificial sweetener in it. Um, and pipe drive, which I mentioned before, you can check out newground.vc to check out everything they're doing. Prior to starting New Ground Ventures, Zach was a partner at Silver Point Capital and worked as private equity investor at Goldman Sachs. So, Zach, thanks for joining me. Thank you. So, do you remember pipe drive? How did you first discover pipe drive? I do actually. Uh, one of my business partners and uh, great friends, um, Sonny Vanderbeck, founder of Satori, uh, co-founder of Satori Capital. Um, at the time, this is before I launched New Ground. We were collaborating on early stage investments. Sonny had just started using Pipedrive. And it's funny, you mentioned, I think, 10,000 customers. I don't remember the number of customers, but I think the you know, common metric in, in SaaS companies, uh, they were doing something like 4,000, no, sorry, 400,000 of, um, no, no, so it's probably 40,000 of monthly revenue, uh, of monthly revenue. It was just, wow. really just getting started. And I think, so that, that's how we, we discovered it as customers. Sonny emailed them. They said, you know, we'd love to talk. We had a conversation. And it was one of those, uh, Jeremy, where we kind of made a, a very quick decision. Uh, didn't necessarily have to, but we knew the product. We knew it was pretty simple. We saw their very early metrics, but we made a, an early investment as a, as a bet on a, a team and a, and a great product. And in that case, I think, got, you know, we're just very fortunate. And, and that's one that's just been a, you know, an awesome, an awesome one to watch for a long time now. They're amazing. Yeah. What did you see in the team? And it, you mentioned specifically the team. So not just the product. What did you see yeah. in either the product and the team at the time? Yeah. So, you know, quickly on the product side, um, I, I had a little bit of experience with Salesforce at my prior company and enough just to know that people had a lot of challenges using it. And it could be uh, complicated. Just, people would complain about it and then maybe just convert to using a simple spreadsheet um, and Pipedrive was just a very simple, uh, lightweight way to manage, as you I'm sure know as a customer, 
uh, to manage your pipeline and any, you know, your investor pipeline, your sales pipeline, um, really kind of anything. Um, and, and so that, that just, it was a product that worked and you could see using, um, on the team side, uh, it was one, I think, you know, the, the, the team, uh, was, were, were all, uh, in, they're almost all, I think, involved in a sales training business and they had a good amount of sales experience and it was, it was admittedly, you know, more gut instinct. We had a couple of calls. We liked how they talked about their business, we liked their strategy, but we could kind of sense that they had just really good native selling skills and that was you know, good for how they could grow the business yeah. but also um, uh, you kind of told us they knew their customer they knew what it was to be a, a small business owner maybe you know one to one to five employees managing a sales pipeline or maybe just a, a small team within a larger company trying to kind of pursue leads efficiently that was who they knew and they they've always kind of spoken to that audience uh, really well through not only the product obviously but their their communications and, and the integrations they've, cho they've chosen to make. So, um, so that was, it was kind of what we saw. I'll tell you one other thing, um, even from the get go, um, they were one of the teams that was just very uh, consistent about putting out a, a simple, but really helpful update. Like every month, you know, to the, almost to the day, you kind of hear, you know, here are metrics, good, bad, how you can help. Um, and literally, I mean, I, I funny enough, you mentioned it. I got one today. Hmm giant company now, like they don't probably need to update me anymore. Um, but they're just systematic about tracking, tracking their metrics reporting. And I think that's one thing that's just super highly correlated to good overall performance. Yeah. And I want to, I want to talk about at some point what advice, cause if I'm sure people ask you for advice, the New York, the companies you invest in, I'm, I'm curious of someone who took your advice and just actually implemented it and um, did an amazing job because of the advice but I want to just point out, like, you know, it's interesting. They experienced the pain points, right, at Pipedrive. And it's funny. I was on a call with another founder um, last week. I, and I go, I don't, I said to them, I don't have stock in Pipedrive, by the way. I just thought it would be good to organize. And so we did a screen share. I showed them how to create a pipeline in less than like two minutes and add someone from the email and Gmail. And they're like, they were dumbfounded how easy it was. And I set up the columns for that, like in my Pipedrive. I'm like, this is as easy as it is. No, I'm like, listen, I don't have a horse in the race here. Like, I don't make money if you buy them. And they're like, okay. You know, they just saw it, how easy it was. But, um, you know, on that, they probably, you know, Pipedrive sends you updates. They probably are have that communication. They get advice. Can you remember a company that, um, or more than one company that basically wanted your, your advice since you have a lot of advice helping a lot of companies? Yeah, yeah, great, um, great question. And, and I think you're doing this for, for a while now and over, I think, about 140 companies um, since 2011. Uh, there, there really aren't any hard and fast rules. Um, I will say that, um, you know, one that I think about a lot is the more sort of independent the CEO founder is, uh, the more they, they don't, in a way, uh, you know, need you, but they know how to strategically kind of connect with you and maybe they know that you're particularly good at something or you have a certain relationship, they, they, they tap into you and in a short amount of time, you can provide a lot of value to them, but you're not talking to them every week and kind of struggling and, and, and why is this not happening? Why? The more I would find to be you know, concise about it, the more that you would um, spend with certain teams, the, the sort of better indicator that was that things weren't going the way they were, whereas the pipe drives of the world, they're off to the races they, again, they might touch base with you or you touch base with them, um, but it's quick and it's efficient. Um, that said, I mean, where we've evolved to, I mean, there's kind of two main threads of, I think, what we provide. And one of those is just, um, you know, connection and relationship with a founder, a person who's building something uh, creative and doing something very, very difficult and under a great deal of stress, having someone they, they trust uh, they, they respect, um, they know kind of has their back, cares about them and cares about the product and shares, shares that vision and the product wants to see it come to fruition. Uh, that means a lot. And, and particularly the ones who bet on them early before it's kind of looking like they're going to be successful. So just having that relationship and I'm lucky to have had that now over a number of years and, and being able to kind of problem solve and have any kind of conversation and, it, and, it, and the range is, is really wide. Um, and even just that ability to, talk through a topic that, you know, I might find sitting in, in my office, like really, really simple. 
they're like, wow, that was really helpful just to be able to kind of brainstorm and even have you ask me those questions and, and then kind of get to the answer with, with you kind of listening and telling me what you think. That's subtle, it's subjective, it's, it's simple, uh, but sometimes I think it's pretty helpful. I mean, it's definitely part of the job I enjoy, uh, a part of the job I enjoy most. The other side is more tangible. If you, if you look at our background, uh, Jeremy, relative to some other venture capitalists, we are a lot more um, sort of uh, financial markets, transaction, quantitatively oriented. Um, so whereas you might have certain, fa- uh, certain investors that have domain expertise, or that have a functional skill like marketing or great with you know, publicity and, and, and media. Um, we have a lot of experience raising equity, raising debt, M&A, uh, and, and frankly, just like building models and kind of going through and, and helping them figure out where, where um, the soft spots might be, where mistakes might be, how to, how to sort of present uh, what an analysis looks like. And, and so companies will often turn to us and say, you know, what do you think of this? Or, Here's my, you know, my cohort analysis on my subscribers. Um, does this make sense? And we might, uh, my, my partner and I kind of just, you know, pull it apart, maybe you know, do, do something uh, uh, offline, help them. And so it's much more uh, tactical. Maybe it's an introduction to a bank. Maybe it's going through a term sheet or a legal document, those kinds of things. And, and what we'll see with, with a number of our companies is they're raising money from you know, five to 10 other investors. And, and my hope is that they can have somebody who's an awesome you know, professional CEO coach or a expert in marketing. Um, with us, they're kind of getting a, a, a very light, but uh, in terms of time commitment, but uh, that sort of CFO banking skill set to be contributed, you know, plus some of the other, again, intangible or relationship elements. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's interesting because obviously they're engaged with you, not just for the investment purpose, but for your expertise so they can grow. And so it's interesting, they may pull in different investments, but also the strategic advice for different purposes. And it sounds like yours is like, which is a huge need because I don't know. I mean, let's, if we stereotype founders, visionaries, they're not like, let me build a model for what, right? They're, they're not going in with a mindset, I would say stereotypically, right? Yeah, that's, that's for sure. And I think um, many of the people we work with are but you know, some mix of very creative and very, very deep on an industry, or they've spent years developing a product or discovering something. So this skill set that my partner and I built over a number of years, which I, I think is in a way it's rudimentary, but we, we spent time practicing and honing it um, yeah. and, and, and you know, refining it. Um, if we can kind of couple that with that skill set of, of a founding team, which um, yes, it's, they're not necessarily wired that way. And, and sometimes the, the, the shorthand, especially in a business like food, the, the metrics like um, net revenue, gross margin, uh, even really, you know, really getting a good calculation of, of, of cash runway. Some of these things are, again, they might seem pretty simple, but all founders are not created equal. If I'm dealing with a, a person who's you know, built and sold three companies and really knows the drill versus someone who's new, and the new person might be awesome, but they need some help. And you know, that's not gross margin. Gross margin is you know, actually going to be a thousand basis points lower and therefore you're going to need cash six months earlier. So if we can help them just kind of zero in and even be better at explaining the quantitative uh, framing of the investment to other investors, uh, that's a service we can provide. Yeah, I think that that's really, you say rudimentary, it's just because it's what you do naturally probably, but most people would say it's not. And, um, you know, we're talking about inventory planning. It's got to be difficult with with a physical products company because the more you sell, then you need to buy more to supply. So it's got to be a tough thing to, a tough model to work out, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one of the, the, the sort of traps, I think, uh, in the CPG industry specifically that the early stage investor can fall into because the product might be great, um, but it often can take a lot of capital. And, and de- debt capital is often not, the people working on this, but debt capital is often harder to, to, get, to get out of those early stages before the business is proven and or, and or profitable. So um, these, some of these companies that look great, but they might, they might need to raise you know, tens of millions, hundreds, you know, 100 plus million of equity to get there. Um, we try to find companies that, are, that find a way to be cash efficient or show that they can grow uh, profitably without a lot of investment so that ultimately you know, our business is really about um, you know, investing in an early stage and, and getting a great multiple at, at exit. And the more I'm saying, again, the obvious, you know, the more that company needs to raise, the, the harder it is to get that return. 
So what was the idea, Zach, behind Newground when you first started it? it I will say it was, it was very organic. Um, I, I spent about 15 years in the uh, call it conventional investment management industry, doing a really wide range of transactions across industries, generally later stage companies, and had a, a great background and, and experience both on the, the sort of technical elements of transactions as well as the for, good fortune to see a lot of companies, see a lot of CEOs, learn about a bunch of different industries. And I you know, got to the point where um, I really wanted to do something entrepreneurial and you know, didn't know what that would be. Actually took a little bit of time in that sort of 2010, 2011 time, uh, window um, to explore. So I thought about startups in a couple of different industries and you know, got to the point where I, I think I realized one, my real expertise or what expertise I had was in the, uh, you know, the investment transaction side um, and, and for better for worse, um, you know, wasn't ready to make that leap into, into the unknown. Um, yet, if I could kind of direct that skill set and that, that, that you know, framework and, and history I had investing capital for the, the prior 15 years, if I could direct it towards companies with, uh, you know, focus on uh, you know, early, early stage and growth companies, it comes with focus on health, food, education, those that I was interested in, that would be kind of interesting. So I spent a couple years, as I alluded to, uh, just, just doing personal angel investing, including with a couple friends here and there. Uh, like Sonny, for instance, and, um, and just realized, like, I, 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 I love that. One, it, it allowed me to get closer to the founders and teams and have, like, a more direct impact on the companies. Um, and two, everything I was doing was, well, two, you know, two it was, uh, I was always around super smart, creative people with a lot of good energy. And, and three, I'd say, um, I was able to kind of focus it on those, those industries I was excited about. And by the way, where there's growth, where there's innovation, um, and so after doing a little bit, um, I said, that's kind of where I'm headed, uh, you know, kind of see myself heading there and, uh, and let's professionalize it. So raise outside capital, you know, we don't have a big team at all, but we start to build a small team and just be able to do this, you know, better, a little bit bigger, stay early stage, stay in that kind of, you know, one to one to five million of capital raise, one to 10 million of capital being raised kind of zone. So we could still be involved at the growth stage, uh, the real growth stage, um, but, um, but make it into a, you know, a business as much as we could. So the first thing you do, <clears throat> you discover this, here's my expertise, here's some of the stuff I'm interested in, and you go to create a fund that you will go out. So when you, that original idea, were you thinking one particular uh, niche or were you thinking, oh no, we're gonna do health or we're doing technology, what were you thinking in the beginning? It's a great question. I went back and forth on that a lot. And I have friends and, and people I like a lot um, who, who are deep on education, technology, food and beverage, and, and we work with those, those funds a lot. And, and there, there are certainly advantages of that, and I see it. Um, on, on my end, I think it was a function of being a generalist previously. And then we, we have a, a, a view that um, we're there to, within our niche, within our early stage niche, we're there to deliver the best possible risk adjusted returns to our investors. And there's something um, just intellectually, I, I think I, I, I wrestled with, which was, which was, could I really do that if I narrowed my mandate to 10% of GDP, 5% of GDP versus could I, could I create a business where I was you know, deep enough to make smart investment decisions in these industries, but able to see across a wide range of, uh, of industries to kind of try to judge the best risk return hopefully over, and this is over a long, long period of time, you know, hopefully build sort of cross-functional expertise because any industry can get too narrow and, um, you know, to be able to share something that I learned in one industry and transfer it to another. So we did, we did wrestle with that, but ultimately settled on kind of these three major and very broad buckets, you know, deep tech, software, and consumer. Zach, do you remember the first investment that kind of took off that you were excited about early on? Yeah, great, great question. I think you know the first investment I made that that did extremely well was uh, was SoFi. Um, so SoFi. I, yeah, so I invested yeah. in SoFi, and I think it was 2012. Um, another one like a pipe drive, where it was it was the good fortune to meet them. I, I met met them through a firm that passed on the investment. It was just doing a kind of general catch up with someone. They it was a more kind of fun, you know, an established fund at that time. It wasn't right for them. Um, but I, I knew pretty much after the first call that it made sense to me and um, it was super early made up, you know, made that bet based on the team, based on the vision um, and just, we got, you know, got very fortunate. They were able to grow as they have. 
Was that pipe drive or was that someone else? Oh, that was uh, the SoFi. Oh, that was SoFi also. Okay. SoFi. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So they passed just because it wasn't within the normal range that they invest in companies. Is that I think why? It was a little early. Um, I actually introduced yeah. it. It's funny. I introduced it to a couple other angels, friends who passed as well. Um, you know, at that stage, it is very hard to know. Other than if it's the guy or gal who's making, you know, his or her fifth startup um, after all the successes, um, you know, it's, it's just hard to make that bet. And it have, it's certainly not a certainty, but, you, but even with a kind of probabilistically, that's kind of also the reason right. for why we have 140 investments over, right. uh, over 10 years. It's, it's, we believe in diversity, you know, within each pool. Yeah, it's interesting. They're like, hey, Zach, I don't like this company, but here, here you go. But it's just because you're in a different different yeah. range of, of probably maybe their early stage in that company's later stage. Oh yeah. And I think yeah. it's, it's a, it's a field where really you know, smart people can disagree. I had friends tell me that Spindrift was a bad idea. Um, you know, just kind of look at name your company, especially at this stage, because you, if you can't say, Oh, look at this traction. Well, these are, these are pretty early. Reasonable yeah. People can disagree. I always like to ask, uh, Zach, um, what's been a big miss yeah. and uh because you know it, it's it's like you said hindsight's 2020 after the fact yeah it's a great great question I, i've got my list and there's plenty <laughs> of um, but i had um you know real um shots at at you know i'm thinking of two right now i think there's a couple more but definitely at carta which is worth like seven billion or something I, I could have done that at like 10 pre or something like that wow. um and and in there to your question it was you know i, I kind of liked it but i as a, as a person who had an angel portfolio and managed it on my own spreadsheet and everything i was like well what do we need all this for you know <laughs> so um you know just uh and, and i think look like anything it's a function of where you are at that moment and do i feel like i'm full on exposure do i feel like i'm you know, I just had an exit, so I'm ready to, you know, kind of wait. And that was just a moment where I, for various reasons, said, you know, I just, you know, nothing negative about the team at all or the, or the company. Yeah. Just didn't feel like, didn't feel it. Um, but big miss. And then um, Peloton. Mm. You know, I had a, and that was, you know, that was um, not entirely my decision, but um, but that was one where, uh, meaning there was some negotiation with our partner that we were working on at the time. But um, that was one that we saw very, very early, um, and, uh, and and weren't able ultimately weren't able to transact. Um, but obviously, you know, I'm always curious I, I about that. I bought the stock after the pandemic, though, so I'm always curious about that because you know, right now things are obvious, but at yeah. the time it's not so obvious. I'm wondering what people, what you see or you don't see. I, I've had past people on that said they passed on ways early on they passed on yeah. one person passed on salesforce early on um what was it with peloton obviously you saw a lot that was good was there anything at the time that was like oh i don't know if it was a category thing or what was it that that didn't kind of line up yeah i think it kind of gets to how for for me for me the thing i, I wondered the most was you know, how big is the market for a three thousand dollar bike and and does this, you know, it's, it's one modality. Does it, does it, does it really persist? Is the, is there, is there, is there value in this whole, uh, you know, distributed ecosystem being able to race, friend, race your friends and um, all kind of questions. I, I felt like the risk return was very good and, and was ready to go. Um, but it was more about that, just like the size of the market um, given the price. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I could see that. It's like, well, you have a stationary bike and you can get one for whatever. Much yeah. less. Yeah, put your iPhone up here, your iPad up there. Right. And you're good. Um, what do you look for? I mean, maybe let's talk about your uh, food company because I, I love food. Uh, Zevia is amazing. Kavita is amazing. Copra is delicious. What's um, one of the drinks? Uh, how did you discover Zevia? So I don't think I'd ever tried it. I'd seen okay. it in Whole Foods a number of times. We got approached. Um, it's funny. I don't remember how we met them. Um, I think it was just through a mutual friend in the industry and, uh, we're just super impressed with the CEO, um, Patty Spence, who, who actually did let a, a management buyout after a lot of experience in the industry, uh, bought the company. I think something like 10 years ago, we invested after that, we invested in like 20, 
13, 14. And it made several investments since. So it's one we've kind of followed, watched, invested in again as we've seen them hit their hit their milestones. Um, but no, it was funny. I mean, I, I, I don't think I pre I love how you said, you know, there's no artificial sweeteners. I don't think I even appreciated stevia as, you know, is a plant. It's not an artificial sweetener. There was all that noise about, you know, it has this aftertaste. And, and I'd say a couple things. One, even when we originally invested, I got to the point where I thought this product's really, really good. The product's gotten meaningfully better over the last several years. They've gone from, I think, seven or eight ingredients to four. It's very clean and, uh, and, and, and I think the taste has just gotten better and, and more broad, is more broadly appealing. And to have a, a zero calorie uh, beverage that people just love and these you know, fun, diverse flavors and, and uh, you can appeal to a wide cross section from youth to adult. Um, it, it hit a lot, it checked a lot of boxes and, and you could kind of see the writing on the wall as, as has been you know, evidenced with soda. And so you know, soda is a just massive category, 75 billion or something, I think in the US. And, and have a, a, a company that at the time, I think when we invested, it was you know, 20 or so million of sales. Um, and we felt like, you know, maybe this, maybe this will, maybe it will be a you know, huge company, maybe it won't, but there's a ton of room to grow. And, and we just liked that we were investing behind a seasoned, uh, seasoned CEO had, uh, had, had invested a lot of his own capital into the business and just managing it really, really well. Um, and, and it's one where, you know, I feel like we've, We've um, you know, just been, been lucky to have gotten involved in an early, early stage. Zach, I love to hear, you know, I love hearing your mindset behind why and some of the check boxes that have to be there really doesn't move forward because I'm sure a lot of things come across your desk and you have to give a lot of no's for every yes. So you mentioned a couple. I'm just curious, you're maybe in your head, your check box, you have to check these boxes. You mentioned a big category. Is that like a definite, yeah, it has to have a big, a big opportunity. What are, what are some of the check boxes you're thinking of for you to even consider it? Yeah, it's interesting you, you say that. Um, we definitely study the market and want to understand the size and the potential scale. There's no, no, no way around that. Um, we don't have sort of a starting point of has to be a huge market. Um, I think a lot of folks will kind of come into this and think, you know, where the unicorn is going to be and you know this cup this industry needs to have a unicorn and who's the team to do it um not to oversimplify but our our approach is a little more micro which has pros and cons so it's gonna come down i think to a, a, you know a few things a lot of which are we have in common with other other investors um first it's your first exposure to the, the company is, is the team what's your what's your rapport with the founder um, and, and it's, it's a mix, um, for, for me in particular of someone who is very knowledgeable about their business and feels like they're, you know, they're, you know, eat, eat sleep and breathe this, this company and, and have passion for it. Um, and also are commercial. That's a huge part of it for us. Um, you know, knowing someone who really is, you know, ideally not necessarily in, 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 in having started a business or being in banking or anything, but kind of understands money, knows how to manage capital. You feel like they'll be responsible stewards of it. It means a lot to them. I had a founder once tell me early on, like, listen, and this is when I made a personal investment. Like, I know you've, you've invested with your own money. It's the only person who's ever said this to me. It's like, I know you've, you know, written a check with, you've written a check with your own money. I want to tell you, I appreciate that. And I'm not going to lose your money. Literally word for word, I'm not going to lose your money. And that meant, it was after I decided to invest, they kind of reflected the person that, were, that ended up turning out really well. Um, but I love that mindset. Like it yeah. matters. They treated it like it was theirs, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so CEO, that, that early relationship, um, that, that, you know, do they, do you feel like you're being educated? Like they've thought of, you know, they've thought of the issues. Um, another one, do they, do they love questions? Do they, do they kind of embrace question and challenge or are they defensive and closed? And that's a huge thing. Huge red flag. If, if someone bristles or has to cut off and, I love the CEOs who are like, you know, just whatever you got, bring it. And uh, I enjoy the, you know, maybe you'll teach me something or maybe I'll just show you how much I know about my mm -hmm. business. Um, CEO. Um, uh, and then, and then the, and I'm, I'm skipping a lot of things. We're kind of trying to highlight what's most important. Yeah. Um, it, it's that sort of economic framing. And I, I, I say it generally because it's everything from the unit economics of the business to the cash burn and the cash needs that the business is anticipated to have and the transaction. So we care, we care a lot or more than 
the average venture investor that we see. Um, whether it's, you know, we might really like the company, but it's, you know, it's 12 million pre-money and they have very little revenue. That's, that's hard for us, um, especially in a, a business that's going to grow most likely in more of a linear kind of way. Um, we want that, there to be a really strong upside if we're right, a uh, really strong upside case if we're right. Um, we think a lot about downside too, which again is not, not, not so much the purview of venture investors. You, you, you know, it's much more important to have the, the giant home runs than to not lose money. But we're sort of wired in a way that we want to we want to lose money less often, and and we care that you know let's say something we think we could it has you know intellectual property an asset that if things don't work out so well we could recover some meaningful portion of our capital and maybe make a profit if things don't work out great. We love it when we feel like we can you know kind of come out whole if if we uh, don't hit the you know the home run. Yeah, what's well, tough? And thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I mean I think you know someone who's coachable. You know, it sounds like embracing the questions um, and, you know, really focuses and, and realizes the, the economics of things. I'm curious on the traction side of things, right? Because it's tough because you're going early on. What's a company that didn't have a lot of traction um, and why you invested? Yeah. Can you think of one or like really early on that you, you kind of saw the vision of it, but maybe they didn't have a ton of traction to go off of? Yeah. And look, sometimes it's about judging what traction is. Um, and I, I think about a, a pharma company. We, we don't do a lot of pharma. Um, we've, I think we've done you know, a handful out of the 140. Um, and in this case, it's a company called Remedy. Um, it's now owned by Biogen. Uh, and it's a, a, a drug to treat um, people who suffer from stroke. Hmm. And this was one that was super interesting, uh, that one of those where the uh, entrepreneur actually found found this, this, this research um, by w walking into a lab, I believe it was the University of Maryland a long time ago, and went from that stage to getting the company funded and, and running trials and ultimately, ultimately exiting. So really cool entrepreneurial story, a CEO we, we think really highly of. Um, at the time, the um, only traction was there was a 10 patient trial. Hmm. Um, and in, in, in sort of, um, you know, science circles, that doesn't mean a heck of a lot. You certainly can't, right. most likely can't sell that to a, a pharma company or take it public with 10 patients. But the, the, the evidence, the evidence was, was really dramatic. They, they essentially reversed. They took something that was like an 80% death rate, made it an 80% survival rate mm. in the 10 patients. And then of course you do the, you backfill and you try to understand the science. And this is one where there were a number of experts investing or had invested already. We were able to, about, you know, to kind of diligence the science pretty deeply, as deeply as non-scientists could. But it was one where it was, it, it, they had trouble raising money, um, for sure. And, and, and we're turning, and that was before the fund started, they, they were turning to angels and high net worth individuals uh, to, to, to fund them. And we're able, to had, we're able to accomplish a lot with a little. But it was, that, it, it was kind of that bet that... that That's a tough them. one. Yeah. Zach, I was talking to... Uh, a medical doctor yesterday, actually, and we were talking about the topic and he's like, I don't think I'd ever invest in a pharma company because it's yeah. so hard. You need so much money. There's so many trials. You just, it's just so difficult. So it's a big yeah. bet yeah. when you do that. Yeah. And, and that was one, we, we've actually backed this team three times now and their, their strategy is somewhat unique. They take existing compounds that have a proven safety profile and, and then, you know, try to repurpose them into some other use. And, and not just out of the blue, they're talking, the scientists, as you know, are all the time are looking at does, just like they're doing with COVID, and does this drug do this? And they're able to find these kind of interesting uh, phenomena, often in research, and then, you know, hopefully acquire the compound for very low amount of money, get a bunch of uh, protection for it. So you, you skip a lot of the development. That makes phase. sense. That's smart. Less, it's exactly. like growth and hacking and creating drugs. Exactly. More capital efficient. I agree. It's a very, it's why I move. it's a very hard industry, especially for people that aren't scientists. What about um, Nimble? Nimble is another cool company that I've come across. Yeah, well. that's one I'm, I'm not um, super close. Met them through a, uh, a founder uh, that, who's a friend of the founders. Um, it's a similar thesis to Pipe Drive. It was maybe two years after I, I did Pipe Drive. Um, and, and I'm, it's one I'm not as close to. I think they've, 
grown reasonably well, like not to the scale of a pipe drive, um, but like the company and, and, you know, feel like they're, uh, you know, it's a, it's a solid, you know, solid product. that's you know, that's certainly, you know, certainly grown since we invested. Totally. Talk about team for a second. You've assembled a team. What did you, how did you assemble a team? What were you looking for? Yeah, great, uh, great question. I, I started off uh, on my own, um, and then I was fortunate to, to find a, uh, a person who's our director of operations right now pretty early on. Um, so the first fund was really um, in the two of us kind of in a, in a co-working space in, in Westport, Connecticut, um, getting, uh, you know, getting off the ground. Um, I, I knew that for fund two, uh, that if I was to grow, that I would need to expand the team. So again, got you know, pretty fortunate that maybe six months before that would have been the right time to start down that path. I met someone, um, Anthony, who has a pretty similar uh, background to mine um, in terms of having an extensive financial background, a lot of private equity and, and credit experience, and was interested in some ways uh, for you know four different reasons. Interested in the early stage, he comes at this more from a, a, a technology. Uh, standpoint really interest in technology software ai um uh the, the you know, pharma and biotech um as you know i came at it a little more from the, the your food beverage healthy living angle um so between the two of us we, we covered a lot of ground uh, in terms of industries we've you know we know and are you know can diligence um but that that kind of common lens of of looking at a company evaluating the risk return of the investment you know as i talked about earlier helping helping the founders on the, on the analytical side. And then just having that just more, you know, relationship driven, you know, we're, we're, we're two like very intense guys in terms of you know, wanting to do good work and wanting to be successful, but we're also you know, collaborative and, and, and just want to have good relationships and support and, you know, not be about us, all that stuff. It's, it, we really try to pride ourselves on building the longstanding good relationships with both, you know, both the teams and the other stakeholders we work with. How do you find companies or how do they find you? It's a, it's a myriad of ways. Uh, at this point, we get a lot of inbounds from just people finding our website or LinkedIn. Uh, more, uh, so the, the long tail gets us to like, I don't know, 1,200 to 1,500 deals a year that just come over the transom, of which we will do you know, five to 10. Um, so it's, as you said earlier, it's a, it's a super low. You do think rate. 1%, like 1% yeah, is re- pretty much what you'll yeah, end up One or with. below for wow. sure. And so, um, so uh, the ones that I'll tell you, the ones that we end up spending the most time on, um, well, I'll get back to that. The, the thing we, we try to be it was as democratic as possible. Like literally look at everything, even if it's a person we don't know and it's coming in off the website, you, you never know. Occasionally those surprise you and, and they, they, they get to you for a reason on the, you know, where we spend most of our time, it's through the, the sort of network of trusted relationships that CEOs we've backed in the past, our investors, other sort of friends in the industry who we've invested alongside. Cause then you, you, you kind of speed up a lot of the, the work, the, you know, is the person trustworthy, honest that you'll get a lot of the benefit of, of their, their knowledge. Um, and just, it's more predictive that if so, you know, someone else that, you know, made an investment or, believes in this person it's more likely that you'll get there so i, I bet you know 70 percent of the time we spend on diligence is from people or, or other companies that, that we know so it looks like zach so let's say a thousand to two thousand companies come across your desk maybe you invest in 10 what's a good ratio that you feel like okay here's what we want to be a home run here's what's going to be a single or double and here's you know, you're going to have the ones that strike out. What's, what's a good ratio to look at? Yeah, we've, we've certainly modeled that. Um, you know, I think, I think something like, a, a, you know, 50, 50, um, you know, 50% are very good to, to home run. I mean, the, you're only going to get probably, you know, with some notable exceptions that, you know, one or two out of that 10 that are going to be home runs. Um, the others in that top 50% are going to be you know, two to five X, something like that. And the rest will be sort of returning capital and failing. And we expect a high failure rate uh, in, in, this, in this business for, you know, for, for obvious reasons. What's an underdog? You remember it looked like it was slow going and then they just took off. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, look, I think Spendrift was, was definitely an underdog um, in the, 
the, it got to the point where the, the, how I built this podcast just did a story on, on Spindrift and, and Bill Krillman. So you can kind of hear the, uh, the history that they had. Um, but that was a, 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 a soda company, um, a craft soda and a glass bottle company. And they did have you know, some good early, early traction we invested, but it had kind of a, a limit. It was an expensive product. It had sugar in it. And, and a number of people when I invested you know, thought, as I mentioned, you know, don't see the thesis there, Zach. It doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> um, and, and that was, that was one that's clearly part in part uh, the founder and just believing that this is somebody who knew how to figure things out and just had a, an intense drive to, to do so. And what he did, which Bill did, which uh, was you know, the early breakthrough, was um, ba basically convert this to a, uh, a seltzer-focused company, so a no-added sugar company. And a in a can, a can is the delivery mechanism. So it reduces the cost meaningfully. That got them into Trader Joe's, which really let their growth explode. And so that what what it is just to, for completeness, it's a fresh um, fresh juice and vegetable only seltzer. So it's the only product on the market, unlike a Lacroix or Bubbly or these others, that don't use any flavors or artificial additives. It's it's just fruit and seltzer. It's a you know, delicious product. And just fi figuring out the fact they could figure out how to how to do that, make, you know, create a, a product that could, could um, kind of maintain its freshness and, and, you know, and its taste and be delivered at a low cost, um, and then figure everything out with marketing and distribution. It's pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. But again, not something that a lot of people um, were willing to bet on early on. Yeah. Um, you know, Zach, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to point everyone. I have, I have two last questions I asked, but I want to point everyone to newground.vc. Check out what they're doing. Check out the amazing companies they've invested in. Um, I always ask since in Sparty Insider, what's been a challenging time, low moment, what's been a high time? So I figured maybe for the high time, you could talk about maybe one of the, the fun exited stories. Uh, you have a bunch on your website, you know, from Kavita to Case Next to 915 Labs to a, a bunch. Um, but as a founder, entrepreneur, what's been a challenging point? And then we could talk about uh, a proud moment. Yeah, you also start with um, start with a challenging. Yeah, start with challenging. the challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I think I think just getting it off the ground was was hard. Um, I, you know, I went from being in a you know, senior role at a, a large fund, um, you know, to you know, I'll put it in quotes, but you know, to kind of being an expert at what I did, um, to being an amateur. So moving into a new a new. Uh, a new business where I didn't know a lot. And so on the one hand, I, I loved, I love the, that's why I stuck with it. I love the learning and I love the you know, interacting with the, with these CEOs and management teams and, and finding the companies I was able to find. That was a thrill. But at the same time, you also, there's a lot you don't know. There's a lot you're learning for the first time. There's a lot I obviously wouldn't, I would do differently if I had it to do all over again. So while you're going through that early phase and you question like, is not necessarily like it's not questioning the decision to do it it's like but it's more you know am i doing it right like is this is this going to work um and, and partly that's why i waited a little while to raise outside capital i felt at least uh, you know I, I can do this i can do it professionally um so, but that period's a little it's a little awkward and it's different um and i'm thrilled that i did it i think it's kind of part of a journey that you know you're lucky to have um to make that kind of a, a pivot um but there are days when it's like this feels kind of different and hard I guess you could relate to the founders you invest in, right? Yeah, and I think that helped, you know, help slash helps that, that you kind of share. It's different, um, it's certainly, but because um, I have a multiplicity of bets and they're kind of putting everything into one, which I admire deeply. Um, but yeah, that, that journey and the awkwardness and the, the challenges and little things you have to deal with, like that's, that's helpful then from sitting up on a high perch and, you know, having the, and not really being able to relate to what, what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, what about on the flip side, a proud moment and um, maybe a fun exit story? Cause that's ultimately, you know, there have been some, I guess we call home runs in the, in the mix too, which is always fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, such a good, um, such a good question. I feel like the exit is, it's kind of a, it's a financial milestone. Like everything's sort of done. The story is almost written and it's not, it's not, it's obviously a good thing and it's, it's the right thing, but it's almost a little anticlimactic hmm. um, because it's simply the, the path 
how, um, like as a, for instance, I'll, maybe I'll combine the two. Um, I was able to sell my position in an ed tech company um, pretty recently, just sold it to another investor. Um, it was an early personal investment I made. Um, just out of comp- respect, I probably shouldn't mention the name, but it was a, it was a um, you know, content company and I invested in it super, super early. It was founded by a, a teacher, um, a former teacher. Um, and and, I, and it was one where I, like, I love the idea. It was all about kind of reading instruction for, you know, for kids in schools. Um, and, and the way they were doing it, I thought it was just smart. Um, and and it, it, it played out and, like, better than anybody could have expected. It raised. Yeah, especially in COVID, right? I mean, it yeah. probably went through the roof. Because of- yeah, and that, it's funny because I did it like right as COVID was going. I sold and, and we use the product extensively. Um, I literally probably use it almost every day. I'll just tell you the company actually, it's, it's New Zella. Um, and just to give them a, a plug and, and, a, and a gratitude and some gratitude, they, um, they just provide great, you know, great current events content for kids. And, and, it, and it's, it's mm. it, you know, if you've seen the product at level, it can take any article and level it like five or six different ways. Mm. So kids of different ages can, reading abilities can read it. Um, but to see that grow to that point where it's in all these thousands of schools and, and my kids using it, um, and I had a, as all, as all of these, honestly, tiny part in their success, but, you know, proud to have seen that proud to have helped a little bit, proud to have believed in them, you know, in an early stage and, and back to the, the question on exit. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Um, happy, happy about it, but it wasn't so much the, you know, the part of it that, that was the, the, the excitement as much as this is a a product that's gonna gonna live on and help people and, and be you know be enjoyed by people. Yeah, for some reason I picture like you know Kavita sells so, and you like you celebrate, but yeah. it's it's really it becomes more obvious at that point. So it's not it's anticlimactic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, a little bit. And and, it, and it's funny like maybe maybe back to the the what are you proud of? It's like when you go to you go to Whole Foods and there's a whole end cap of Kavita. You know when three years before, four years before, like, what the hell is kombucha? What the hell is kombucha? <laughs> that was the point when, you know, early, early in kombucha, there was no yeah. health aid, there was no, um, you know. Not People much didn't know what it was. They yeah. really didn't. Yeah, it was, it was GTs in Kavita. Um, so, yeah, seeing, like, seeing that and having your kids or having your, your mom see it at the grocery store and say, wow, I just saw your product. Um, you know, seeing SoFi do a Super Bowl ad, even though, again, that's kind of long past. You know, those are all just kind of cool um, yeah. to, to see that that growth from you know, these very humble beginnings. Um, Zach, are there any companies that you, like you said, that other company said, listen, Zach, uh, we're not a good fit, but you may be a good fit. Are there any like that in your uh, in your universe where you recommended to someone else and it did really well because you recommended it? Hmm. Interesting. I'm pretty sure I can't think of a company right now. I do a lot of introducing, um, and 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 the uh, what I think I think I I, um, I hopefully developed a good sense of among the sort of you know small but meaningful peer set I have of other investors is knowing what they like. Um, like I introduced Spindrift to a good friend, and I invested too, but they invested even more, and I think done well with it. Um, I've made a number of introductions to later stage investors as well. Um, but, um, so here, here's the thing. Usually it's me saying I'm putting money in and I want you to, I want to show it to you. Cause I think that's the ultimate kind of endorsement, of course. And, and kind you put of, your money where your mouth is like, yeah, I know, they're, 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 they're looking to raise the more game, capital. Right. But yeah. then there are times where I like, no, this is a, a really interesting, um, I've used uh, product and education technology. I've used it. I've sampled it. It's just not quite a fit. Maybe, maybe they're raising money at a valuation that's too high for us given our kind of risk return lens or, or maybe it's just we're over concentrated and direct to consumer beverage right now, but you should look at it. I do a lot of that too. Um, and I, it's interesting. You know, nobody really jumps out, but, um, but I try it in every, in every yeah. case, honestly, to make, Kind we of spread the spend drift. Yeah, it would be an example where yeah. we like it. I think you like it and you bring someone else in to it. Yeah. So, um, Zach, I want to point people to newground.vc. Is there anywhere else we should point people towards online or is that the best place? No, that's, that's great. Um, you know, our website does a decent job of telling you kind of what we do. Um, if, if you're, anybody's interested in 
you know, showing us a company or reaching out for, for capital they're raising, we're always happy to, happy to consult and, and talk. So just you can ping us on the website and uh, love to share more. Cool. Check it out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.